We use to categorize forces into two kinds, non-contact forces and contact forces. Now we're going to learn another way to categorize forces. The work done by some forces does not depend on the path it takes, but only depend on the initial and the final positions. Such forces are called conservative forces. An example of a conservative force is the gravitational force. Now let's compare the work done by gravity when I move this one kilogram from here to here via different paths. I can move the one kilogram from this initial position to the final position along a straight path. For this path, gravity would do negative work because the gravity goes down while the displacement goes up. If the force and the displacement are in opposite directions, the work done is negative. Or, I can follow a zigzag path, like this. For this part, gravity will do negative work. But when the object comes back down, gravity will do positive work. Because uh, mg and displacement are both uh, downward, so the work then is positive. And then, for this part, Gravity will do negative work again, which means uh, the work done by gravity for these two segments, they cancel exactly. And the work done by gravity for this part is negative, which means uh, the work done through this uh, zigzag path is exactly the same as the work done through this uh, straight path. I can also move it along a path like this. Horizontal first, and then vertical and then horizontal. For this segment, gravity would do zero work because the gravity would go straight down while the displacement goes horizontal. It's a 90 degree angle and cosine 90 degrees is zero. So gravity does not do any work along this part. And then through this upward part, gravity again does negative work and then zero work. So gravity does the same amount of work along this path as the straight path. So gravity is a conservative force. Its work does not depend on the path taken. The work only depends on the initial and the final positions. Now let's look at friction and see if friction is a conservative force. I can slide this apple from here to here. I can follow this straight path or I can follow this uh, zigzag path. Do you think the work done by friction is the same for the two paths? Is friction a conservative force or not? When I follow this straight path, what kind of work does friction do? Positive, negative, or zero? Friction does negative work because the displacement goes to the right while the friction goes against the sliding motion to the left. Opposite directions, so friction does negative work. Now, if I follow this zigzag path, let's see. For the first part, friction again does negative work. When I slide it back, friction does even more negative work because the displacement goes to the left, friction goes to the right. Again, friction does negative work. And then, if I slide it further to the right, friction does even more negative work. Friction does different amount of work when the path changes. In fact, the more distance it travels, the more negative work friction does. So friction is not a conservative force. It is what we call not a liberal force, but a non-conservative force. Because the work done by a conservative force does not depend on the path it takes, but only on the initial and the final positions. For every conservative force, we can conveniently define a potential energy for it. A potential energy that is associated with the position or configuration of an object. That's why we have gravitational potential energy, but no frictional potential energy. Now let's take a better look at this thing called potential energy. We use PE or capital U for potential energy. And we're going to start from the work energy theorem. That is the work done by the net force 
equals to the change in kinetic energy. The work done by the net force is also the work done by all of the forces added together. Now, since we divided the force into two different kinds, the conservative force and the non-conservative force, we can divide this uh, work done by all of the forces into the work done by all of the conservative forces and the work done by all of the non-conservative forces. And this still equals to the delta K. Because the work done by a conservative force does not depend on the path it takes, we're going to define a potential energy for it. That means that it is going to be a potential energy, which is kind of like kinetic energy. So I'm going to move it to that side to be with the kinetic energy. So if I move this to that side, the equation would turn into the work done by the non-conservative force equals to the change in kinetic energy minus the work done by the conservative force. Now this is going to be the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy because they're the same kind of things, so that's why I'm adding them together. And I can also take out the delta and then this is uh, the change in kinetic and potential energy added together. So the definition for the potential energy is the change in potential energy equals to the negative work done by the conservative force. Here is our old work energy theorem. And this one is our new work energy theorem. They are the same thing. They both mean conservation of energy. In this equation, we consider the work done by all of the forces, conservative and non-conservative, and the work turns into the change in kinetic energy of the object or the system. In this one, we're replacing the work done by a conservative force with the negative change in potential energy. So we only consider the work done by the non-conservative forces, but this work done is turned into the change in both kinetic energy and the potential energy. We're using one to replace the other, so we either consider the work done by the conservative force or consider the change in potential energy, but not both in the same equation. For example, for gravity, in this equation, we consider the work done by gravitational force. In this one, we consider the gravitational potential energy. If we consider both in the same equation, we would be redundant. By the way, we add the kinetic energy and the potential energy together and call it total mechanical energy. And we use capital E for it. Now let's derive an equation for the gravitational potential energy. Let's say I lift this mass m up by delta y at a constant speed. Using the idea of energy conservation, the work done by the non-conservative force, that's uh, my force, equals to the change in total mechanical energy, which is the same as the change in kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Notice that in this case, I consider the gravitational potential energy, so I do not consider the work done by gravitational force. To lift this object at a constant speed, same speed, same direction, there's no acceleration. That means if I draw the force diagram, mg and uh, my force would be also mg upward to cancel with it. So the work done by my force would be mg but my force will go upward. The displacement is delta y also upward, so the angle between the two is zero degrees. So this gives me mg times delta y, and this would equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. Now the kinetic energy doesn't change because the box moves at a constant speed, so delta k equals to zero. This says the work I do, the energy I give to the box, turns into the increase in its gravitational potential energy because the box is now at a higher location than before. So delta U 
equals to mg times delta y, which means the potential energy, the gravitational, this is sub g for gravitational potential energy, or we can say the gravitational potential energy PE equals to mgy, if you take away the delta. Okay, and this happens to say PE equals to, if you rearrange this, it's uh, gym. Now, of course, I can also use that definition to find the change in potential energy. Remember the definition for the potential energy is that delta U equals to the negative work done by the conservative force. Now, our conservative force is mg. So, this is the negative work done by the mg. The, now, the conservative force mg goes down. The displacement delta y goes up, and the cosine 180 is negative 1. So the negative and negative, they cancel. See, we get the same thing. Delta u equals to mg times the delta y. Same thing as this right here. And this y over here can be set as the height above ground. The reason why I put the ground in quotation marks is because it does not have to be real ground. It is more like a reference point. For example, I have this row of tape. I let it go and it loses gravitational potential energy and gains kinetic energy until it hits the table. The amount of potential energy loss would equal to mg times its changing height. In this case, it can be convenient to use the tabletop of, as our reference point, ground. So its height goes from 0.5 meters to 0 meters. But I can also use the floor as the ground. Of course, now it would seem to have more initial potential energy than before because it is now 2.2 meters above the floor ground instead of the 0.5 meters above the table ground. But it does not really have more potential energy than before because this row of tape is still at the same height. It's just that the mgy to the floor is more than the mgy to the table. This is okay because what is important is the change in potential energy. Whichever ground you choose, the change in potential energy or the mg times delta y would be the same. If the floor is my reference point ground, the y would go from 2.2 meters above ground to 0.7 meters above ground. If the tabletop is my reference point ground, the y would go from 0.5 meters to 0 meters. Either way, you have the same delta y that is negative 0.5 meters. Therefore, the same change in potential energy mg times delta y. I can even choose the ceiling as my ground. If the object is below ground, our y would be negative. So as the row of tape falls, the y would go from 1.5 meters below the ceiling to 2 meters below the ceiling which means the y goes from negative 1.5 meters to negative 2 meters. Again, the same negative 0.5 meters for delta y, the same change in gravitational potential energy. So it does not matter what you choose to use as your reference point ground. You just have to make sure that you consistently use the same reference point ground throughout the entire problem. Don't use one ground for the initial position and another ground for the final position. We will get more practice in the next few videos.